At Westport, they switched pilots. The pilot that had been in charge was L. Rockwell. He changes shifts and a pilot, John Eldridge, takes over the helm and he takes the boat out of the dock at Westport and starts steaming north. As pilot Rockwell settled himself into bed, as soon as he had fallen asleep, the boat was jarred by this massive, grinding, ripping, a boat destroying sound, everything lurching. Rockwell rushes into the pilot house and he sees John Eldridge still at the helm. Eldridge turns to Rockwell and asks him, can you please account for my being on the mountain. And Rockwell looks out to see that literally they are on the side of Split Rock Mountain. There are trees, tree branches near the pilot house of the boat. The stern of the boat starts to flood. There are about 50 people on board and it starts to sink down by the stern. Captain Rushlow, the captain of the steamer, immediately gets everybody out of bed onto the deck and loads everybody onto the shoreline so to make sure that nobody is injured. And, everybody manages to get out with only a few bumps and bruises. And over the course of the coming days, as much as could possibly be taken out of this steamboat was salvaged. All the wood, everything that could be taken off of it, even the pilot house, was taken and recycled into buildings all around this part of Lake Champlain. There are still buildings over in Westport that are made from timbers from the Champlain. There was an inquest it was found that the pilot was known along the pharmacies along Lake Champlain for buying opium, for buying laudanum. And he had, over the course of the preceding weeks, stopped at different pharmacies, sometimes multiple times, to buy opium to relieve pains that he was having. So although he was never convicted in a criminal court, he was certainly convicted in the court of public opinion for being in an opium-induced stupor as he ran the boat aground in a run that should have been second nature for him. When winter came, the lake froze, the hulk was frozen into the lake, and as the ice went out, it dragged the wreck around, actually turned it 180 degrees so that the part that was up on the rocks got turned into the deeper part of the lake, and that part in the lake where you can see the massive damage from it running aground, the staves, the, the frames that are broken, is in about 35 feet of water. And then the shallower part of the wreck, the stern post, is in about 15 feet of water. The dive is shallow. You descend down the line into, uh, down to the mooring block. Once you get to the mooring block, it's about 20 feet to the boat. So you can see the, the shadow in the distance of this very large form off in the distance and as you swim the guideline towards the boat you see this really massive structure take shape underwater. The stern post is still standing on the boat and as you swim it you're, you're struck by how massive the boat is. When you have the opportunity to dive on a wreck and understand it for the first time, to have a chance to look at a wreck that nobody else knows about and to be able to figure out what this shipwreck is and then take that information and share it with the public and be able to present we found this new shipwreck on Lake Champlain and you're finding and revealing new knowledge to the public and to me that's very satisfying.